Well, the legislative session comes to a merciful close as lawmakers tackle health care reform, tax cuts, the billion dollar Big River Steel Mill Super Project. Joining me to talk politics is Rex Nelson, writer, columnist, and essayist on all things Arkansas. He's also president of the Central Arkansas Political Animals Club and a former communications director for former Governor Mike Huckabee. Welcome to the program. Well, Roby, thanks for having me on. And Always a pleasure. And I left off about 15 of your other titles, which <laughs> would tell our viewing audience that you obviously can't hold a job for very long. Yeah, so. well, you said the right thing, and that was the uh, <laughs> adjective merciful at the end of this <laughs> longest legislative session since the Great Depression. Uh, it was big, 100 days. Oh, and, yeah. And really, they still have to come back officially and uh, sign and die, which is their formal adjournment there. But let's talk about, uh, this was the first legislative session since Rico construction 138 years that the GOP was in charge and they had both chambers mm -hmm. I guess the quintessential question is, is did they prove that they could govern effectively I think at the end the certainly the leadership in the House and the Senate did a good job of pulling enough of their members to join with Democrats to certainly govern effectively and I think that was a big question coming in in that those margins were so narrow Republicans having 51 out of a hundred house members it was a little bigger in the Senate obviously mm -hmm. but in the house you had to wonder whether we would get anything done in the end we got a lot done but it took a long time <laughs> it did and you know about halfway through the session really the the gun debate the abortion debate mm -hmm. seemed to be front and center I kind of felt personally that the the turning point in the session was that day that Davy Carter went down to three committees in the mm -hmm. House and basically gave a halftime speech as a, as a coach and said, we got work to do. Yeah. Let's get to business. Yeah, a absolutely. I could not agree with you more. When Speaker Carter came in and said, enough of this. We've got a budget to pass. We've got to deal with this Medicaid private option issue. We've got general improvement to start talking about. It is time to get focused. I think that was indeed a turning point. Why do you think that they needed that type of rally per se? I mean, why, why was there, was it a reflection, do you think, of poor leadership at that point in time? Or do you think it was this concept of, we hadn't been in charge before, we're used to lobbing the grenades I, and seeing I, what happened, and everybody kind of finding their way through these reversal of positions? You've got a real, you've got a real division in the Republican Party, and it, and it comes with when you're in the majority sometimes you start fighting amongst yourselves as the saying goes and uh, you have the more business type Republicans that focus on fiscal issues and then you have the more social Republicans and some of the people frankly that were came in on the Tea Party wave and those are very different people I think the ideologues within the party really were controlling the echo chamber, if you were, in the first weeks of the session. I think the media was suddenly focused on it, and it took Speaker Carter finally to say it's time to focus on what a biennial session is really all about, and that's passing a state budget. Do you think that, that uh, this, this rift that you've described, this obviously carries on into the oh. political repercussions of the next year, year and a half, does it not? Oh, absolutely it does, and I think it is really, Roby, too early to tell. I, I wish I could sit here and tell you that Republicans either help themselves or they hurt themselves with this legislative session. I've got to sit back and watch a little bit because on the one hand you could say, well, the Senate Majority Leader, the Senate President Pro Tem and Michael Lamoureux, the House Speaker and Davy Carter pulled things together, they got it done at the end. Or will the Democrats, as they try to focus on the more uh, ideological members on some of the really out there legislation that was passed on uh, Nate Bell tweets and things like that. Mm -hmm. Will that take the focus and will that win the day politically? For me it's too early to tell the answer to that. Sit back and wait as a good political observer <laughs> will do. Uh, you can at least subjectively look at this session and say I think somebody had a good session. I think somebody could have had a better session. Who do you think may be shown above all the others uh, out there? I, I think in the end, the speaker certainly had a, a good session. I think because he was able to get enough Republican votes to get the private option done over in the House, because he was able to get the tax cuts that he wanted through, 
I think he had a very good session, and I think that has to lead to speculation that now there probably is a greater chance at the end of the session than there was at the first of the session that maybe he jumps into that Republican gubernatorial primary and makes that a three-man race rather than a two-man race. Well, and that's a great segue to this topic here is because if you look at how GOP primaries have played out over the years and where we kind of are in Arkansas now with politics and a Republican primary, I've talked to various sources who say maybe 100 to 150,000 people will, you know, take part in a Republican primary next spring. That's not a big number. If Davy Carter can be this energetic new candidate and bring new members into the party fold, does he have a chance of winning the nomination it, against it, a, an old hat like Asa Hutchinson? It, it, it's a lot bigger number than it used to be. I mean, I was involved with what up to that time was the most high-profile Republican primary in history, and that was that Tommy Robinson Sheffield Nelson race, which dominated the media in this state for almost a year and only 80,000 people <laughs> ended up voting in that race. 80,000 decided it, so it's a lot bigger. I think that Carter could stand a chance, especially, and, I, and I'm going down the line, but those of us that like to play politics do that, especially if Tom Cotton gets in that Senate race against Mark Pryor, that opens up the 4th District, and you have three or four people in that race, and there are three or four Republicans that are talking about it, that are thinking about it. That could draw a bigger Republican primary turnout than usual in South Arkansas and could lessen the importance of Northwest Arkansas. That plays to the speaker if he's in the race against Asa Hutchins. Con conversely, you've got the 4th District as Mike Ross's home base, and there's going to be some people that will want to vote in that Democratic primary for him, number mm -hmm. one. And number two, there could be multiple Democrats get into a congressional race if that seat opens up, too. So I I'm still kind of not sure how that factors into this mm -hmm. Uh, election cycle for this next year. I agree with you. It could be big uh, dilution of the Republican vote mm -hmm. from Northwest Arkansas, but it could also be helpful to the Dem Democrats as well. You know, six years ago, if you would said Asa Hutchinson, he's from Northwest Arkansas, shoe in against a candidate from Central Arkansas, Curtis Goldman from Central Arkansas. If Davy Carter gets in, he's from Central Arkansas. I'm just saying Northwest Arkansas is still very important in a Republican primary, but not as important as it was six years ago as more and more people get used to voting in Republican primaries in other parts of the state. The, the dominant issue in this legislative session was the health care insurance expansion, mm -hmm. the private option as it's called. Um, do you think that that blunts that as an issue to bang Democrats over the head with as Republicans have done for the last two election cycles, Obamacare, health care? Now there's a Republican plan out there that has addressed this health care problem. How does that play out, do you think, in terms of an issue in the next election cycle? It may blunt it a little bit, but I've got to tell you, in a state where Barack Obama is as unpopular as he is anywhere in the country, I still think the mere fact that he's in the White House during the 2014 election uh, cycle benefits Republicans. We certainly saw it happen in a big way in 2010. We saw it happen again in 2012. If you're a Democrat, you had much rather be on the ballot in 2016 when there's a new president rather than 2014 when Barack Obama is still at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That has not deterred Mike Ross from getting back into this uh, governor's race. And we've seen he, he and Bill Halter, have, are, they're already at each other's throats. I mean, they're a week into the race, a week and a half into mm -hmm. the race already, and we are seeing, it's as if the election's next week. It oh, like I, I mean, Ross came out, came out swinging a little bit out of character for him, even. Uh, and you think of Mike Ross as being a little more moderate guy. He comes out swinging. Halter, of course, is not afraid to swing. I, I, for those of us that just sit back and watch it, it's going to be a very fun race to watch. Uh, I think you have to say early on that Ross is certainly the favorite, but that's not to, that's not to count out Halter. And if a, if a fairly well-funded third person should get in, a John Burke Halter type at least, you could certainly force a runoff. And then runoffs get really crazy because it becomes all about turnout then, as you know, during that three-week runoff runoff campaign. All right, last question for you. We got Senator Mark Pryor up for uh, re-election. We, we think, we speculate Tom Cotton may be his uh, mm -hmm. first opponent there on that. Uh, do you think that, that uh, Mark Pryor is on the ropes like Blanche Lincoln was, or do you think he's in better shape than Blanche Lincoln was when she ran for re-election? I will say this. If I had been Mark Pryor, 
I would have been praying back in November of last year that my party's nominee, President Obama, lost. I, ju I just think it is a terrible time to be running statewide as a Democrat with Barack Obama in the White House in Arkansas. So yeah, I, I think Mark Pryor has a very tough campaign against him, regardless of who the Republican nominee is. All right, he is Rex Nelson. You can follow his ramblings on his blog at rexnelsonsouthernfried.com. It's great stuff, Rex. It's not <laughs> ramblings, it's good stuff. I appreciate you so much being here. Thanks, Robbie. Hope you'll be back with us soon.